Okay, everybody, we are back for another episode of the Supply Chain Solutions Shipso Series. Today is April 6, 2023, and this is episode number 12 in our yearly series. So the timing of this week's show is perfect because we're going to have an opportunity to provide everyone with an update on the OSRA, the Ocean Shipping Reform Act. So Jason and I will unpack this today and provide a real-time update on the new legislation that has just been added to the new draft of the bill. But before we go into it, Jason, how are you? What's going on? I am great. Let me tell you, a lot of stuff's been happening. Um, you know, you've got the more exciting past couple of weeks. I was I was talking about you on the other show. I was like, he's down in Panama. He's lucky. He's working on his tan. I'm up here in Michigan. Who knows what the weather's going to be like tomorrow? No tornadoes, though. So that was good. <laughs> the beautiful thing. Yeah, I had the opportunity to go down to Panama, Panama and represent Supply Chain Solutions in a big supply chain uh, conference for all of our global partners. So it was tremendous, but amazingly hot. Uh, so I'm glad to be back. But with that, we're going to talk about the Ocean Shipping Reform Act today. And I think before we get into it, I think it's important for all of us to know what is the Ocean Shipping Reform Act. Now, the act revises requirements governing ocean shipping to increase the authority of the Federal Maritime Commission to promote the growth and development of U.S. exports through the ocean transportation system that's competitive, efficient, and economical. Now, uh, the bill requires the FMC to do two very important things. One, to investigate complaints about detention and demerge charges and uh, charged by common ocean carriers. And two, to determine whether those charges are reasonable. And lastly, there's a third one out there that I omitted, order refunds for unreasonable charges. And it also prohibits the common ocean carriers and the marine terminal operators or the ocean transportation intermediaries from unreasonably refusing cargo space when available and restoring uh, or resorting to other unfair or unjustly, you know, discriminatory methods. So, I mean, Jason, I am sure you can remember back during the peak of the pandemic, uh, it was really tough to get an export uh, container out. Yeah, um, I'm sure you have no, no um, doubt about that. But, um, you know, and the reason for that is a lot of ocean carriers did not want to load export containers because they wanted to reposition um, empty containers so they can have a return import. So that is an extremely unfair practice. But with the Ocean Ship and Reform Act just signed into law last June, as I mentioned earlier, this legislation really awards more power to the Federal Maritime Commission, and it's really supposed to help mitigate these ongoing disruptions uh, that we were experiencing with the U.S. supply chain. But I think what we really need to do is we, we need to ask ourselves a couple of questions here. And uh, one of the first questions that Jason and I came up with was, is what do logistics leaders who ship using ocean freight need to know about the new Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2022. And I think while the OSRA provides certain powers and directs the FMC to take a more proactive role in investigating carrier behavior and establishing rules governing fairness in detention and demerage, uh, you know, I think what they want to do is they want to be able to be in a position to enforce carriers' obligations to support U.S. exports. So like we were just talking about earlier, we couldn't get a lot of export containers out during the pandemic because carriers didn't want to load them on their vessel. Mm -hmm. And some of this legislation um, is going to shift the burden of proof to the carriers in the, in the cases where there's disputes, which is a huge benefit to shippers who did not file complaints in the past due to this burden. And a lot of shippers and freight forwarders and drayage carriers didn't want to file complaints because they were afraid of retaliation by the marine terminal operators as well as the uh, carriers. So what I thought was really interesting, 
and I think Jason will really appreciate this, is while the act provides these and other benefits, the impact of Azra that it's going to have on ocean shipping in the U.S. is really going to rest squarely on the FMC and how they enforce the new rules. But, you know, you guys need to hear about this, though. For example, fining one carrier $2 million for unfair detention and demerit charges when their quarterly EBIT, their earnings before interest and taxes, exceeds $4 billion is hardly going to make a dent in the ocean carrier's behavior. I mean, Jason, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. And I think that, you know, the, the fine needs to fit the, you know, what's going on. I think the, the good news of the timing of all of this is, you know, I don't think there would have been much power from the FMC during the peak of the pandemic to actually enforce many of these practices, because it would have just been viewed as another thing impeding the flow of containers, another hoop to jump through. But now, because we're in this kind of, like the pendulum has swung, right? We swang over, swank. <laughs> we were over on one side of the realm with just no capacity. And obviously our costs were through the roof. And now we're on the other end where we don't have the demand. So this is a great time to actually kind of rebuild ourselves and and what is allowed in a better way. Um, and I think what's going to be happening with a lot of these ocean carriers is those insane profits. I mean, we both know this, right? They're going to be substantially lower over the course of this year um, and definitely even into next year. So, you know, I think the good news is some of the fines, I think, will be more painful now than they would have been. But at the same time, I totally agree with you. I mean, if it, it, it's... It, yeah, they're making so much money on the merchant attention in the past. They're going to be fighting this tooth and nail. It needs to be a practice where, you know, it's more than a slap on the wrist. Yeah. And, you know, $2 million, let's be, let's be honest, folks. It's just a, it's a drop in the bucket. It's a blip. But one of the other questions that Jason and I wanted to hone in on was, will Azra, will that Ocean Shipping Reform Act result in improvements in port congestion or lowering costs? And um, while Osra is going to bring a lot of benefits to shippers in the long term, it's not really going to have an effect today or in the future on the market challenges that leaders face, including uh, port congestion and high shipping rates. And now, even though we know now that, um, you know, the rates are pretty much down in the in the tank right now and they're probably the lowest they've been, you know, pre pandemic. And even though we're hearing about a series of general rate increases that are going to be implemented by the carriers as we move into May, June, and July, because May is contract uh, season, um, you know, uh, I, I still don't think we're going to see those kind of benefits from Osra. But these issues and are more structural in nature, and the rates are really a function of high demand and low supply. So neither of which Osra is going to resolve, but. Uh, you know, as we move along, um, I think one of the other questions that Jason and I were thinking about is how should logistics leaders address the current challenges in light of Osra? And I think um, given the impacts, uh, you know, uh, given that impacts are unlikely to be felt in the near term, shippers really need to continue managing detention and demerge as closely as possible and implementing visibility tools that better manage this effort uh, is critical to drive the improvements and i was just talking about this a little earlier to jason and, and i said you know that's really one of the big benefits of partnering with scs because you know with our new platform now being implemented uh it's it's you know the the visibility tools, the predictive analytics, the the artificial intelligence and the tracking capabilities and reporting capabilities is really going to be a big benefit to uh, our partners. So shippers need to work with companies like SCS and they need to focus on building better relationships with carriers and and tighten agreements to lock in those allocations and gain a commitment to, uh, you know, from them to improve service with a more predictable cost. And, you know, that's one of the great things about working with us because, you know, we do have our allocations that can protect our clients. But, you know, I think 
we need to tie this into the ongoing and detention and demerge practices and fast forward it to 2023. Mm -hmm. And as we mentioned earlier, it's really clear that the FMC rulemaking process is the motivating force behind the Ocean Ship and Reform Act. And, you know, the fast moving developments around changes to detention and demerge billing are happening amid this ongoing rulemaking process by the FMC. Um, uh, you know, around the assessment of charges to consignees and the drayage companies. Um, so there's a lot going on behind the scenes. And, you know, the agency, uh, the, the Federal Maritime Commission has until mid-June to issue, issue final rules on detention and demerge billing and, uh, you know, and, and implement a process that was mandated. This is a process that was mandated when they passed OSRA in June of, of 2022. So, uh, you know, this is really going to, you know, you guys are really going to get a charge out of this because earlier this week, the head of the U.S.'s largest MTO, Marine Terminal Operator, Ports of America, denounced the idea that shippers should not be assessed to merge fees if the terminal is closed on a holiday or weekend and allowable free time has ended. Now, that's really interesting. Um, and, and to quote uh, the president of Ports of America, he went on to say that the cost borne by the marine terminal operators in storing a container at the terminal that has improperly exceeded its free time remain constant, whether or not the terminal is open or not. The Ports of America president again stated Tuesday when he was at a House committee hearing on maritime and supply chain issues that a marine terminal is not intended to be used as a warehouse. So, Jason, I mean, can you imagine? I, I got to tell you, I, I was reading that as well. And that kind of that frustrated me quite a lot. Right. Because the idea is if your container comes in at the wrong time and you get assessed these, you're you run out of free time. Let's say <laughs> if the yeah. port is open and you don't have the ability to move your container, you shouldn't be in a situation where demerge and detention should be able to be assessed because. At that point, you know, obviously we can't predict down to the exact time your container is going to arrive, right? When it's coming over from the other side of the world, things happen. Weather happens, congestion happens, strikes happen from what's been going on recently. So the odd chance and the unfortunate chance, because you and I have both, I mean, whenever a container is coming in near a holiday, we're crossing our fingers that it doesn't hit at the wrong time. And gosh, I swear the process of even crossing our fingers makes it always land at the worst <laughs> possible time <laughs> it is like how oh, how did we do this but but seriously it's 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 ridiculous to think that you know they're gonna charge demerge and detention over holidays or over periods where the ports closed and we have seen that the ports can can carry way too many containers not suggesting they should be but you know talking about generally speaking one day out of the week anyway yeah personally it's crazy it's crazy yeah. but it was important that we mentioned this because now there's going to be like a really rub to that as we move on in today's show, which we'll get to. But I think everyone needs to know that there was a congressman from South Dakota named Garamendi who helped spearhead the passage of Osra in 2022. And now this uh, congressman and there's also a Republican that's helping out with this as well. Uh, and I can't think of his name right now, but. He's helping to, they are helping to draft new legislation that would update some aspects of the Ocean Shipping Reform Act law, inclu including publicizing more broadly the penalties imposed on the marine terminal operators and the ocean carriers as a result of shipper complaints. And the legislation aims to really draw a sharp line on the involvement of China based entities in US shipping. But Jay and I are going to save that for a couple of minutes down the road here. And we're going to circle back to that uh, because there's a rub on that, too. But we want to just tell you about the new addendum to the law, which was dubbed the Ocean Shipping Reform Technical Act of 2023. And the draft bill, the updated bill, would 
focus on these two areas. It would heighten transparency into regulatory penalties levied against ocean carriers and MTOs by ordering all sanctions to be publicly posted online. And then the second point that it's going to focus on is under uh, OSRA 2022, uh, the interim charge com uh, complaint process. So there was a process that they tried to outline in the legis in the law that was uh, in the legislation that was signed in the law in June of last year, and the Federal Maritime Commission only publicizes certain cases. How about that? Okay, so it's it's a selective form of censorship when it comes to the complaint process, uh, because many of these cases are settled confidentially. Mm -hmm. And the bill is going to call more attention to all the complaints made against carriers and terminal operators by shippers, drage providers, and consignees, and the course of action taken by the regulators when these complaints are lodged. And again, remember, you know, Jason, and I said a lot of people were afraid to to you know have a complaint or make a complaint because they were afraid of retaliation okay even though it was always categorically denied okay by the shippers or mtos so i think the purpose here with the new draft of this um potential addendum to the law is to establish a more permanent and transparent complaint process uh and that's been a major initiative for shippers who are pressing for more clarity on the permanent charge process. Uh, and certainly that when a complaint is brought to the FMC, it's going to be investigated. Now, Jason brought this up to me just a couple of days ago, and I had seen it just this week. Okay. Okay, folks, the dominoes are falling. MSC, Mediterranean Shipping Corporation, and HMM, Hyundai Merchant Marine, and MERS are ending demerge billing when the U.S. terminals are closed. Okay. And but now the carriers and the MTOs are countering by saying legitimate uh, demerit and detention is needed for the flow of cargo. So, Jay, you have any thoughts on that? I've got so many thoughts on this. And <laughs> we have to take we almost have to take the carrier side for a second. Right. Because if everyone didn't pick up their cargo, we would have a massive issue. And if there was no rhyme or reason or you know penalty involved, you'd assume that you know, the, the ports would get overrun and we, that's just, that's just what happens, right? Unfortunately, we're on this penalty-based system, but that's kind of gets people motivated, right? Um, that being said, it is very interesting that three large prominent ocean carriers decided to end this practice. And um, I would say it kind of stinks that they knew, uh, they knew it was quite an unfair practice, quite publicly viewed as not a, uh, you know, what should be happening. And I think what the greatest thing about this, this update, this technical update to OSRA is the idea that everything is going to be brought out publicly. So every demergent detention can be seen, reviewed and seen again and kind of filed away. That will at least, I mean, this is a beneficial thing for everyone because if the ocean carriers and if the ports truly don't, if they're charging this truly out of an inconvenience for them, then if we're seeing the same things pop up, as a business community, as a shipping community, we can fix those things. In the past, only certain things would be posted publicly. Most were dealt with confidentially, like Anthony was saying. And that doesn't allow for us to actually build a better system. Now, with every situation where something goes wrong, it's posted, it's public, the reasoning is public. That will ultimately allow us to create a better supply chain. Now, it's there's never, and Anthony and I try to discuss this weekly, there's never one answer. There's always so many variables. There's so many companies involved. There's so many links. There's so many things that have to be updated to see an improvement because bottlenecks are just all over the place when it comes to logistics. But this is something that I think will enhance visibility on multiple different aspects. And when we can have more visibility to what's going on with another link in the chain, you can build around that. And that's huge. Um, I want to add one more thing. It's that uh, the bill also has this new advisory committee. It's going to be called N A, excuse me, N S A C, um, National Shipper Advisory Advisory Committee, and it's going to involve importers, exporters, but also they want to include um, port officials and ocean carriers. And what's interesting about this is it's not just trying to say, hey, we think you're really, you know, playing foul. 
um, with these charges. It's saying we want you at the table to understand when we make these changes so we can have an open discussion on a regular basis to improve the system. So I think it's I think this uh, this technical improvement is a really cool, cool addition. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, you know, just to to uh, tie that last up before we go into the part about China that we wanted to hold off uh, till last for, you know, as we mentioned, the FMC has told mid-June to issue new detention into marriage rulemaking, which is a requirement that was part of the passage of OSRA in 2022. But what I think Jason and I found really interesting was as part of that process, the FMC just announced last week that it was querying the 11th um, largest carrier serving the U.S. trade lanes, as well as the U.S. terminal operators about their detention and demerge practices. Um, basically, kind of asking, asking them, hey, what's your methodology? We want you to explain this to us. So it was really interesting because I found this, uh, inf this article where uh, Federal Maritime Chairman Daniel Maffey uh, told the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee uh, last Thursday at a hearing because they he was there to try to to get more funding to boost enforcement to boost the enforcement arm of the FMC. He went on this he went on with this question and he said the idea is to make sure that detention and demerge does exist, right? You know, and um, you know then he. You know, after he said that, he, he he went on to say, we were asked, why don't you suspend it when there's so much unfairness going on? And and the truth is, is that many of the carriers and the marine terminal operators said that, you know, we cannot because if we sp if suspended it, these detention and demerit practices, it would only be worse. And there would even it, it there would even be more you know, legitimate detention and demerge. And that's very, very important to keep cargo flowing. So mm -hmm. folks, let me just tell you, I've been in logistics for 36 years and no importer wants their containers to go into, to, to get detention and demerge. Right, Jay? I mean, obviously not, you know, so, you know, here we have the flip side of the coin where people are saying to us, well, hey, we need that detention and demerge to keep the port flowing. I mean, to keep the cargo flowing. So that really struck me. And uh, I think Chairman Maffey went on to emphasize that the assessment of the demerge must follow the incentive principle, meaning that such fees should be incentivized by importers to pick up their containers in a timely manner and to keep the terminals operating efficiently. You know, if, if the terminal is closed and an importer can't pick up its cargo, like Jason was saying earlier, if that has a downstream impact on other shippers, the in, the importer shouldn't be charged for that for detention or demerge on that particular day, Chairman Moffey went on to say. Mm -hmm. So I just thought that was really an interesting uh dichotomy, you know, and then lastly, Jason and I want to sort of wrap it up with the last part of the the um, three points of the addendums for the new OSRA uh, legislation. Uh, you know, those addendums is the last thing it wanted to do was discourage uh, the ties with China. So the draft bill is going to heavily limit China based entities and their ties with U.S. shipping, and the legislation really seeks to ban all U.S. port authorities from receiving federal funding if they use the China-sponsored National Transportation Logistics Public Information Platform called Logenic, and a lot of us in the industry are familiar with it. The bill also reiterates the need to add ocean common carriers which are going to be held to a higher standard for rate reviews. So they want to add these Chinese owned corporations, these, these common carriers. Okay. Uh, and they want to hold them, you know, to a higher standard. And currently the FMC only has two China, uh, Costco, which is China ocean shipping corporation and it's subsidiary, uh, OOCL. Uh, on the controlled list. So they're actually going to have a controlled list, you know, sort of like, you know, uh, the ITAR, the U.S. Mun munitions list. When we get into export regulations in EIR 99, there's a controlled list. So now they're going to have a controlled list, right? So 
the heightened security of China comes amid the U.S. You know, government's concerns over Beijing spying on the U.S., including fears that the cranes manufactured by the market leader in shore crane manufacturing, which are those huge cranes on the shore that unload container ships, the Shanghai-based company ZPMC, which are used in over 120 ports worldwide, could be tracking and tracing container moves at all U.S. terminals, not only in the U.S., but around the world. So, Jason, what do you think about that? <laughs> yeah, actually, that crane, because I, I read I read that same article, and um, that crane, that statement on those cranes blew my mind. I, I, I haven't had time to dive into that. I need to understand the whole timeline of that situation, because what? But... Um, yeah, you know, we obviously had the controlled list in the past. I think it makes sense to enhance that controlled list um, by just, you know, keeping all the China carriers on there. That being said, you know, obviously, Anthony and me, we're in the we're in the business of global trade. So we don't really like the idea that it's it's harder to trade with some con countries than other countries. Um, we obviously want it to be open, but it's important that, you know, none of this is used for government tactics. So you know, obviously, if they're, um, you know, the, with all of the stuff going on between China and the U.S. right now, the Taiwan situation and, you know, obviously in the past, just semiconductors being viewed as a, you know, a, a need when it comes to um, the economy. It's it's just a, it's a, it's a challenging time, quite frankly. And I can't wait till we're at the beginning of next year. <laughs> I hate to fast forward things, but yeah, we got to get through this kind of the troughs of this whole situation and get back to a situation where steady demand can allow these forces to operate within the normal means um, in the normal ranges. But I've got to look into that crane thing. I saw that. I almost, I almost, I was shocked that I hadn't yeah. heard of that yet. Um, but yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And in closing uh, everyone, you know, I think discouraging ties with China is really going to be front and center as we move through this year into 2024 and beyond into 2025. Um, you know, regardless, I think the decoupling from China has begun. And just this week, while my partner from India, our you know supply chain solutions partner from India is visiting the States, um, he told me that, you know, India is really gearing up uh, for a lot of manufacturing that's going to leave China, not only to just get away from the tariffs, but just because of all the geopolitical uncertainty, a lot of companies are really becoming um, concerned. So the Indian government is investing billions of dollars into their infrastructure and in their manufacturing capability, and they're gearing up because a lot of that manufacturing is going to go over to countries like India and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and Vietnam and Mexico and other countries around the world. So um, I think later this year, Jason and I will probably do a show that gives you a real good picture or snapshot of what that could look like. But in any case, as Jason would say, that's what we got for you this week. That's what we have for you this week. I'm not sure if God is really proper English, but uh, Jason and I hope you enjoyed you enjoyed the show this week and found you know our material informative. Uh, and we also want you to know that normally uh, everyone knows we do the FMR, the Freight Market Roundup, uh, bi monthly. Uh, but next week we're going to have a special guest on our show. And we're going to push out the FMR week because that guest is a guru in all things related to rail services. And she will unpack the precision rail services agreement that was just signed late last year. It's going to be an amazing show. So do not forget to tune in. And Jason, aside from any last comments, what do we usually say? Make it a great week. <laughs> Make it a great week, everybody. And thank you for tuning in. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye now.